Welcome to Asian Review. I'm your host, Bill Sharp. Our show today is the Taiwan military, the good, the bad, and the ugly. And joining us via Skype from his home in Taiwan is U.S. Army retired Lieutenant Colonel Scott J. Ellinger, who spent 22 years in the Army as a China foreign area officer. He's well known for his expertise on Taiwan in general and Taiwan military affairs specifically. He has seven years of direct experience in dealing with Taiwan's military. So today, we want to hear from him, what are the Taiwan military strengths and weaknesses? Welcome to Asia in Review. Well, hello. Thank you very much, Bill, for having me on the show here. I really appreciate the, uh, the invitation and, and uh, the ability here to speak with you and uh, our guests. Great, great, great. Well, during the last four or five years, um, the Taiwan military has really been going through some fairly difficult changes and uh, trying to make a transition from a, a force based on conscription to one based on volunteer, volunteerism. So could you tell us a little bit about those changes and challenges the Taiwan military is facing? Well, I can, well, we'll start out with a little bit of how this transition started. I remember about, uh, about say, about eight years ago, nine years ago, uh, the discussion points, and they've been discussing this for a very long time. It's just, when do they want to make this decision on going from compulsory service all the way over to an all-volunteer force? And because of the, uh, the, uh, the historical um, things that here happen in Taiwan, you know, very similar to Korea, uh, the com compulsory service is, you know, mandatory. Originally went from like three years to two years, then it went to down to like a year and a half, and then to 14 months, and then now it's transitioning to uh, its new pattern. And so the all-volunteer force right now is something that um, has been politicized for both political parties here, um, and it's there for the garner its uh, types of um, uh, their voting uh, uh, targets here. But when it comes to the all-volunteer force here in Taiwan, I mean, there's been a lot of work for it. Um, but there's been a lot of road bumps along the way in trying to make this happen. And the one thing I saw that was bumps. probably the, what, what the, the most difficult part. Go ahead. What, what oh, the, the most, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry. Uh, what are some of those road bumps? What are some of the obstacles that this transition has been running into? Well, first of all, I think what, what the most difficult part was how do you actually create a, uh, a recruiting type of command or a recruiting type of system that really targets individuals here in Taiwan, both, mil uh, both male and female, to actually raise their right, right hand and actually join the ranks. Mm. And something that we spent a lot of time dealing with them and how to, how do you create, you know, honor, duty, love a country to just raise your right hand and say, I'm going to join and actually volunteer. Uh, and then the other part was looking at the other percentage of people that look at the military for, you know, uh, creating a, a better lifestyle um, and trying to, you know, building block to creating a, uh, your educational path. Uh, also at looking at um, creating your, you know, a career path, even though you may not be an officer, but within the, the uh, non-commissioned officer enlisted type of uh, system. So what I saw on that was probably the, the hardest point is how do they create this type of recruiting command or recruiting system that can really inspire the youth here to, to raise their hand and say, hey, I want to volunteer. That was the hardest thing that they've been uh, wrestling with. It's the incentive program. It's, it's answering the why question. Why do I want to volunteer to be in the military? And just kind of, uh, I think it may lead into some other questions is, is in Taiwan for many years, joining the military was not one of the, the, the top 10 jobs to have. Where in the United States, uh, over the last 25 years, being in the U.S. military as an officer or a non-commissioned officer was a an honorable job to have, and it was it was ranked as one of the I think top 50 jobs to have within the U.S. Uh, uh, within the United States. Well, let or me in ask Taiwan, you, it doesn't even hit doesn't even hit the list. Let me ask you this: You know, there's some theory. I I, I would say a theory. There's some discussion, a point of view that the democratization of Taiwan really killed the army. And, and I, the, the, from my perspective, I wouldn't say that it's destroyed the military. It, it's that, or I think right now it's transitioning. Mm -hmm. It's transitioning from this, uh, the conscription to all-volunteer force. And okay. so with that, 
I, I think it's just going. That, this is what the road bump is. The road bump is how do you transition from cons, the conscription to all volunteer force, mm. and that that's the road bump. And I think it's going through the political dynamic of okay, what party is going to garner the um, the the vote so that they have more people? Because to get rid of conscription means okay, all these all these males don't have to do now. It's, it used to be fourteen months. Um, and I think now it's changed over to uh, mandatory four months, and then they're placed on a on a mobilization reserve status. That seems but ridiculous to me. Four months? I, I I mean that just seems to be meaningless to me. And and then what my understanding is, although they're supposed to attend reserve sessions, that the number of people that actually get called up for reserve uh, duty is very minimal. Uh, and and I've often I've talked to people in Taiwan to um, flag level officers. Taiwan flag level officers say even if they caught up all the reserves, they have insufficient equipment to equip them with. So it, it seems to me the reserve component in Taiwan military is pretty weak. Well, that's something we've had discussions with before in my prior time was, you know, wrestling with, you know, what is Taiwan Reserve Command and how to institute a professional reserve force. It doesn't have to be exactly a mirror image like the United States, but something very similar that they have a National Guard or an Army Reserve or an mm. Air Force Reserve, Navy Reserve, Marine Corps Reserve that's very similar where you create um, kind of a, a ramp off. So if you've done active duty service for, let's say, four years, five years, or six years, eight years, and then you just you, you wish to pursue, uh, pursue a, um, a civilian career, is maintaining that, that individual in a reserve capacity or uh, you have uh, an institution that creates the reserve system very similar to the United States where you go through a professional training course, uh, you get all your training done, and then you then you uh, have the weekend drills that we have in the United States, and then you do two weeks during the summer. Uh, and, and I think that's something where if Taiwan, uh, the, the, the legislature, as well as the, the politicians, if they really thought about it hard, I think that would be a great system where they could probably get volunteers with to the level that they want, and they can have a, a, a professional enough type of reserve force that will be able to do their duties uh, in accordance with uh, the, the their missions that are are uh, that are assigned to them. But you know, I, it, it, again, it goes back to I think it, it's it's the it's the will of the the Ministry of National Defense along with the politicians to actually create this type of reserve system mm. that where you look at the mobilization system that they have is you've done your conscription time which now it's four months of active time which is basically you're doing your basic training you're doing your uh, skill skill set for whatever uh, military operational uh, occupational specialty you're going to go into your MOS and then once you're done with that then you come off of that status and then you're mobilized you know, from let, me, call, let me ask you about from, this. There's, there's from what some, I call mobilization is I think they, they get recalled twice uh, within an eight-year period uh, to mobilize. They go to their assigned unit. They do it for X amount of days, which is a short period of time. Then they're done, and then they go back to whatever their, uh, their, their civilian career is. There seems to be some plan that's come out of the MMD recently, the Ministry of National Defense, where... Um, they recall retired NCOs uh, to active duty. It's a volunteer thing. Uh, if you want to come out of retirement for, um, say, like a, a year or two years, then you'll go back to active duty, but um, uh, you'll be considered part of the reserves. I'm not quite sure if I have that right, but um, it, it's something like that. Have you heard of that plan? I, I think they've probably, uh, you know, I've been I've been off uh, been off active duty for three years, so it might have been changed in the last three years. But that's something I think that's probably that's the beginning of looking at how the United States does what we call the AGR system, so it's the uh, the the active guard slash reserve type of system where we that's been there's been those discussions where it's something very similar to that where they look at people that are uh, ETS uh, that you know that's the term not retired but they. They left after X amount of years, then bring them back onto an active status, and then let them come back in. Mm. That might be something new, uh, but I think that's step one. That's mm -hmm. step one to the overall, you know, maintaining the skill sets needed to lead uh, lead soldiers, airmen, 
uh, sailors and Marines in, in, a, in a crisis situation. You know, I, I read someplace an article that um, the Taiwan military is considered the 15th most capable military in the world. Have, have you ever heard anything uh, of that sort? Yes, I mean, yes, I have. And I think with my observations is they're a very professional military. And the assigned well, okay, tasks. What do you mean by do, professional military? Though? You better define that because not everybody might know exactly where you're coming from on that. Oh, professional. Okay. So the, the job at hand, they're able to do the task, they're able to uh, plan the mission, they're able to execute the training, and they'll execute it to a standard that they've set for themselves. And then they do it in, in, a, in a system where, uh, within the military culture, the military professional way of doing things. Uh, doing their mission requirements, they do it right by the book. And they have their uh, regulations, they have the doctrine that's set, laid in front of them, and then they follow it by the T. And so they follow what, what the doctrine is, and, and with that, um, that's what creates, I think, from my observations, a very professional how they do it. So they know exactly what they're supposed to do, and they'll go do it. And so that's uh, what I've observed. I've seen that uh, in that aspect. Uh, the other part is, I think, with um, you know being ranked in the in in the top fifteen is um, they they based a lot of their doctrine off of uh, the United States. Um, they updated it in accordance with how we change. In I don't say as fast as we change, but they 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 updated uh, the doctrine. I think with that um, they're able to. Um, Adjust it so it fits what their requirements are uh, in some aspects. That, uh, they may not be as, as fast as we do, but they, they do eventually change it to that's meet their the, requirements that, 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 as, that's as a modernization. That's really interesting purpose. comment because I've heard some people say that in terms of doctrine, they're behind the times because they do not allow the, um, the, the interaction with the U.S. military that they really wish they had. There is interaction. Um, I mean, there is quite a few training exchanges that do occur, but th this kind of goes into your title of you know the good, the bad, and the ugly. Mm -hmm. uh, some of these things, so I can kind of box it in for you here. And the good part is very professional military, so they do what the standards are. They train uh, in accordance with how the doctrine is laid out for them to do whatever their mission requirements are in accordance with their service. Or we got thirty in seconds until break. Mission. When we go into the bad part is. Uh, I would say the bad part is the ability to change and change rapidly mm -hmm. and make adjustments in accordance with how modernization is, has changed how the United States and how other Western nations have fought their battles. We get those action a after action reviews, after, after action reports, we call them AARs. Once those come back, the United States is always morphing its system to fight better tomorrow. You know, it, we're always changing, very fluid system. We're always looking at how to change as fast as we can to meet the changes of the battlefield. Scott, in Taiwan, I'm going I'm to stop you there because I'm being told we have to go to break, but we'll pick this up when we come back in about 30 okay, seconds, we'll about a minute. Okay, okay. See, you, see you in a couple minutes. Okay. Hi, this is uh, Jane Sugimura. I'm the co-host for Condo Insider, and we're on Think Tech Hawaii every Thursday at 3 o'clock. And we're here to talk about uh, condominium living and uh, issues that affect condominium residents and owners. And I hope you'll join us every week on Thursday. Aloha. Aloha. This is Business in Hawaii with Reg Baker. I'm the host of Business in Hawaii. And we're a show about positive stories of business in Hawaii, both the companies and the individuals. We broadcast live every Thursday at 2 o'clock on thinktechhawaii.com. Uh, and we can also be found on Olelo uh, during normal scheduling. Uh, please join us so we can share with you some of the experience and insight to having a successful business or career here in Hawaii. Aloha. Welcome back to Asian Review. I'm your host, Bill Sharp. My guest today is uh, retired U.S. Army Lieutenant Colonel Scott J. Ellinger. He's joining us from his home in Taiwan, joining us via Skype. 
He um, uh, has served 22 years in the U.S. Army. Um, he was a China Foreign Service Officer, a China Foreign Area Study Officer. Um, very good Chinese. He's lived in Asia a total of 18 years, uh, in Taiwan, mainland China, Southeast Asia, Japan, Korea. So he, he, knows, the, he knows the neighborhood. Um, before the break, we were talking about um, the good, the bad, and the ugly, uh, which is the title of today's show of the Taiwan military. And we were talking about um, Taiwan's, um, how should we say, challenge in changing its military culture, adapting to changes in military thinking in a fairly rapid fashion. So uh, why don't we pick it up from there? Okay, so I remember we, we were discussing kind of we were transitioning to some of the, the issues and challenges that Taiwan faces, and that's changing the doctrine in accordance with how, how things change within today. And so what I observed was, I would say that there are probably about, you know, X amount of years, I don't want to say how many years, but they're, they're behind. And what it is, it, it's the ability to rapidly change. As our doctrine changes, then... Taiwan lags behind in making those changes and, and the gap kind of widens a little bit. And I think with, with some of the exchanges that we've had uh, with Taiwan, I mean, there, there's, we have good exchanges. And so where we go into kind of the ugly part is that during uh, these interactions that we have is we give them advice in um, how you want to make these changes in accordance with whatever skill set it, it's applying to or type of doctrine it's applying to. and what Taiwan will go is it'll go back to what it used to what it used to be doing ten years ago, and they don't want to break out of the, this. This is how we used to do it, and changing is a difficult thing to do, and it's hard and and it's painful, and so it, it's it's breaking through that, and that's the ugly part is the the ability to make the change and the willpower of the senior leadership and the mid level leadership to take the risk on let's change. <laughs> and that's the ugly part. And that's the one part that I, I observed so many times that just make the change. And if there's a mistake, it doesn't matter. You mm -hmm. just train again and you make, your, you make your adjustments in accordance with how you did something, as we do in the U.S. military, is you do something, uh, <coughs> you do your mission, you do your training, you do an action, action, uh, after action report, you... You, you look at it and say, okay, where do we make the, uh, the, the mistakes? And then you go out next week and you train again. Or you may just train again the next day. But the problem is it's something very similar. What happened in the United States military in the 90s is the zero defect mentality is you, you, you don't want to uh, let your mistake, mistakes be shown because your evaluation or your promotion is not going to go, uh, go to right. the next level. Taiwan's kind of stuck in that zero defect mentality, so that's another ugly part that I observed. And I think a very simple change to, to it is where I've advised you know, brigade commanders, battalion commanders. I said, you as a brigade commander, you handle the above, and then you protect your below. And battalion commander, you deal with your brigade commander, get the resources needed, protect your company commanders, let them train. If they make mistakes, it doesn't matter. Scott, let's, um, let's, let's move on to the topic to here. The, it's trying to reverse that culture of instead of top always observing the bottom is let the, the bottom uh, kind of protect itself from the top and fence off senior leadership from always trying to look at this zero defect mentality and trying to like have brigade commanders command squads and platoons. Okay. Uh, it's just changing that, that type of uh, mentality. Okay, good. Um, you know, um, so much, so much to talk about in so little time. But um, let us talk about amphibious assault or amphibious in invasion of Taiwan, which you know everybody talks about, you know, from time to time. So, what what is uh, Taiwan's ability to repel an amphibious invasion? Obviously, from China. Well, that, that's a thesis. Um, and so we can start writing our, our thesis right now here. It's about 300 pages. Well, I, 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 I know that this is a little bit unfair to ask you such a question in, in the short time we have, but give us some idea. I, from the, the ability from Taiwan, what I've observed, their ability to, to defend, it's there. They can defend it. Um, it goes back into the, its ability of, of how, you know, what's your reaction time? 
and this goes into any any type of defensive uh, type of battlefield or strategy that's set up very similar to other, you know, like for Korea, for instance, we can take Korea. It, it, it's your warning time. And if you have enough warning time, are you able to defend uh, and get to your battle positions to defend against uh, uh, an offensive uh, attack? Same thing applies to Taiwan. So it's all it's all depicted on time requirements. If there's enough time to mobilize your reserves, then the defense will happen. And I think would be it, for Taiwan's requirements of defending as long as they can uh, for coalition forces to assist in any type of uh, crisis. It's it's all dependent on what time they have to mobilize. So. What I've observed, their ability to defend, yes, they can do it. Um, to cover uh, all the main uh, amphibious assault landing areas, yes, they can do it. But it's all based on time and your reaction. Coalition forces means the U.S. getting there from Japan and other places in the Pacific, correct? I'm not going to get into political things, but we'll, we'll, we'll use the term coalition forces that okay. Uh, okay. decide to assist Taiwan in a crisis uh, situation, yes. Okay. Um, well, that, that's good to hear. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm glad that you pointed that out. Um, well, now, um, you know, it seems to me that Tsai Ing-wen has got a much different approach towards the military than the Ma ying it, it seems to me, uh, I hope I'm not being unfair here, but it seemed that Ma ying was not really very interested in the military. And the, that's, the military that, that's, kind that's, of um, oh, was hurt by, by his lack of attention. Whereas uh, Tsai Ing-wen really seems to want to beef up the morale of the military, uh, inject a higher sense of professionalism. Uh, she seems to have visited a lot of military bases in the fairly short time that she's been in office, has a lot of ideas about building up Taiwan's own defense industries. Um, kind of what I've described it, and I, I just it's only a description, it's only an opinion. But the, the way I look at Mind Joe was, I call him the Jimmy Carter of Taiwan. I mean, he, <laughs> he really, uh, I would say, you know, the military, of course, is something that, you know, is part of national defense, part of the nation. But I, from what I felt in, in what I could just, from, a, from an abstract feeling is, he just, the military wasn't important to him. And it, 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 took, second, it took second, third seat to everything else. Um, and it was more used for humanitarian disaster relief missions, and that was the primary focus of what he wanted to use the military for. Instead of like, okay, military is great for humanitarian disaster relief. Yes, it's very important mission set. United States is important. Yes, but when it came to actually looking at the morale of the military and giving them the funding and resources to go through the transition to an all volunteer force, it wasn't there. And it really created uh, within the military some negative feelings. Uh, a lot of the, the, I would say, field grade officers and below uh, were not happy. Uh, some of the senior leadership I, I saw, they just left. They, they retired and said, I'm out. And then, of course, then you have the political appointees that they made their rank because of their political connections, very similar to the United States. But those, those individuals, they had to toe the bottom line of whatever the president said. So I, I saw that within the military. Um, morale wasn't the highest. Um, I saw the zero defect mentality get worse uh, mm -hmm. from that. And so that, that's just observations of what I saw over, uh, uh, during the time that Mind Joe was the president. Uh, unfortunately, I just I saw that. And you had people kind of battle through that that, that uh, presidency and his policies for the military, which I thought it hampered quite a bit. With uh, the new president, uh, I think she's, along with some of her advisors, uh, have really looked at, at these issues of looking at morale. And hopefully within the next uh, two to three years, she'll be able to change uh, this morale. She can change the military and look at programs to create I would say the professionalism needed within the military and, and a professional military culture that allows the, the junior non-commissioned officers, junior officers, mid-grade mid officers, mid-grade non-commissioned officers to aspire into what they have and then creating a national image that the military is an honorable and a valuable part of society where people look up to the military 
and you know they salute you know they salute you on the road saying hey thank you for your service which in the US military when I was in uniform or if they know I'm a veteran they thank me for my service it's creating that society to respect the military and hopefully signing one and her advisors uh, on defense can make that transition so society loves the military and honors them okay Scott we're coming down here to our last few minutes so I got a couple more questions I want to ask you but uh, I'm gonna ask you to give me some sh fairly short answers um, spying seems that when lying Joe was um, in in office that there was a this an explosion of spy cases um, uh, occurring in the Taiwan military of course so this means mainland intelligence agents uh, recruiting uh, Taiwan military officers, often at very high level, often at flag level. What's your take on that? And I'm sorry that we don't have too much time to discuss this, but what's your what's your take on that? My quick take on that is it, it it's probably has to do with something with the retirement system, and also with uh, the salaries. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, Taiwan over the last uh, couple of years has raised salaries, but probably not raised them enough. Where as the mainland China wants to, uh, uh, you know, they da they do dangles of uh, of uh, incentives and money, um, it becomes lucrative, and so I think you have some of the bad apples, you know, the two percent, the one percent, or the point five, you know, whatever the percentage is, you know, the, the bad apples that decide to uh, take these incentives. It's unfortunate, and I think it's something where Taiwan really needs to instill. Uh, it goes it goes back to an honorable feeling of being in the military great you know We're down society to about our last 30 seconds uh in the last 30 seconds is there anything that you want to add in uh i think that the last top i think that i think another topic for the future if we want to talk about it is looking at a professional military culture and how it intersects with society's culture and mm -hmm. so in this aspect is professional military culture and how does that relate to uh, Taiwan's uh, society's culture and what are some of the issues uh, and what causes problems when there's too much of society's culture within the military culture and that's I think it'd be a really great good. topic for us to talk about in a future uh, uh, segment. That's a really good point, that's a really good point. Well, uh, I think that about brings us to our uh, close here. Uh, I, I want to continue, but the clock tells us it's about time to go. And uh, I want to thank our guests for joining us today. And I want to thank you for viewing. Uh, next week, my guest will be Mr. Michael Turton. Uh, he's a well-known and also very provocative blogger who will be joining us again via Skype from Taiwan. See you then. Okay, thank you, Bill. And I know Michael is a very good friend of mine. Good.